Time to start the session, time domain analysis. My name is Ryota Shimokura uh, from the Shimani University. The first one is uh, uh, problem solving research on hearing aid. Uh, it's my research. So, start. so uh, I belong in the Shimani University now, but uh, uh, today's topic is uh, works in the previous my position in the Nara Medical University. So Nara Medical University is located in Nara. Nara is located in the, about the center of uh, Japan, below Kyoto. So uh, I was in the assistant professor uh, of the otolaryngology, medical research project, otolaryngology. And the professor was uh, Hiroshi Hosoi in this, our department. So he is the top researcher on the hearing aid. So I don't have the medical license, but he called me this university to, uh, to join the group of development of the hearing aid. So uh, hearing aid has a very long history. The first institute is uh, this one, uh, year home in the 18th century. And the current digital hearing aid has been developed in the 1990s. So digital technique uh, can downsize the body and provide many kind of DSP, digital signal processing. It is very co convenient. And now is the age of the implanted hearing device. So the most famous one is uh, cochlear implant, in cochlear implant. So uh, this figure shows uh, uh, string e electrode is inserted through the, along with the basilar membrane and the, uh, stimulate directly the hair cell by the electri electri electrical current. So in the future, maybe uh, regenerative, uh, gen regenerative medicine is coming. So implant the hair cell coming soon. So for the future, maybe implanted brain, I don't know. So, <laughs> but uh, our research group is interested in the mechanical hearing aid. Mechanical hearing aid, because uh, me mechanical hearing aid can wear and unwear very uh, comfortably and uh, has no risk on the surgeries. So, uh, we interested in, in the mechanical hearing aid. But mechanical hearing aid has uh, three big problems. First one is the application for the profoundly hearing loss. Profoundly hearing loss uh, is uh, very severe hearing impaired, uh, unable to hear even the 90 dB sound. So they uh, live in the completely uh, silent world, okay? And the uh, hearing aid can, cannot provide a sound sensation for the profoundly hearing impaired patient. The second problem is the ear fullness by the ear plug. So in the long history, uh, you, user always put the ear plug uh, in the ear. So this uh, wearing style does not change. So ear fullness uh, annoyed user uh, and they're comfortable. So, <coughs> third one is uh, uh, application of, for the sensory neural hearing loss. So, there is two kind of hearing loss. One is conductive and other is sensory neural hearing loss. The conductive hearing loss is in uh, is a case that uh, 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 source of disease is in the outer ear or middle ear. On the other hand, uh, sensory neural hearing loss has a, a source of disease in the inner ear and further uh, auditory processing until the uh, cortex. So for the conductive hearing loss, uh, patient with a conductive hearing loss uh, can identify the world uh, per perfectly uh, when the uh, word was presented in the uh, loud volume. On the other hand, the patient with sensory neural hearing loss 
cannot completely uh, answer the world uh, even in the optimum sound pressure level. So uh, every uh, function of the hearing aid is always amplify, only amplify the sound. So uh, hearing loss can support uh, conversation perfectly for the uh, patient with conductive hearing loss, but uh, uh, particularly for the sensory neural hearing loss. So uh, our research group uh, struggled to the, these three problems, and uh, today I uh, produce uh, the solutions. For the profoundly hearing loss, we have developed bone-conductive ultrasonic hearing aid. So first, Gablo reported bone conduction ultrasound is audible. Can you believe it? So ultrasonic sound is uh, upper above the uh, 20 kilohertz. So usually we cannot hear the ultrasound, but uh, con by the vibrator, uh, using like this um, to stimulate the mastoid uh, to buy the ultrasound, uh, the user can hear the sound sensation. It's very interesting. And uh, 50 years later, Lenhout uh, reported the uh, bone conducting ultrasound can be heard also the profoundly hearing impaired person. Okay, so uh, he uh, modi modulated ultrasound by the speech waveform like this, uh, presented uh, and present for the impaired, uh, profoundly impaired patient. And the patient can hear the uh, word by this mechanism. And Hosoi, uh, it's my boss, it was my boss, Hosoi reported that the bone conducted ultrasound can also activate auditory cortex of the profoundly hearing impaired person. So uh, objective research uh, can show the profoundly hearing impaired can hear the bone conducted ultrasound, uh, ultrasonic. So uh, in base of these uh, research data, we have developed uh, bone conducted uh, hearing aid. So this is a test model, and this is another test model. So uh, this hearing aid records the speech sound uh, of the talker and modify the amplitude of the 40 kilohertz ultrasound and present uh, by the vibrator. So a profoundly hearing, uh, profoundly impaired hearing loss patient can hear the word like this. So let's show the uh, rehabilitation. He is a uh, profoundly uh, hearing impaired patient. Ho He said he did answer the is right. ピオトうん。おし。お、おし。ベンと。カンガルー。カンガルーイザアニマル。カンガルー。カンガルー。世界。あ、イズコレクト。白熊。白熊イズホワイトベア。白熊。白熊。世界。はい。ライオン。ライ
So I conducted rehabilitation for him, and uh, uh, this is a uh, number of sessions uh, from one to, until the 11. May, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, past one year. So he can uh, present the correct answer at 80% uh, for the uh, world test on the three options. So next second program is uh, ear fullness. So um, uh, to change uh, uh, this situation, we uh, developed the transducer like this, this one. So this transducer vibrated, vibrated oral cartridge. Oral cartridge make outer ear of outer ear and distributed extra half of the uh, external auditory canal. So this transducer vibrated uh, uh, all the cartridge and the vibrated cartridge generate sound directly to the external auditory canal like this, this uh, red line, yes. So this mechanism, mechanism is very close to the voice coil and horn of the loudspeaker, the same mechanism. So using this mechanism, uh, you have had to vibrate only the cartridge. So when user, uh, like the ring shapes uh, transducer, we, we can amplify the sound without occluding a uh, canal like this. So, uh, how much the hearing aid can amplify the sound? So we conducted experiment like this, measurement like this. So one is a touching condition. The transducer was touched to the oral cartridge. In another one is a non-touch condition. The transducer was apart from the uh, cartridge. So in this case, the cartridge does not vibrate it. So uh, please, uh, let's compare the result. This figure shows the result. Uh, frequency and uh, sound pressure level in the canal. So when in the non-touch condition, the sound uh, from the transducer itself can be recorded like this. On the other hand, at the moment to the touch the cartridge and uh, of the cartridge with the transducer, uh, the amplification like this. So uh, maximum at uh, uh, 50 dB, uh, especially in the low frequency in the two of the two kilohertz. We call the this uh, hearing aid uh, cartridge conduction hearing aid. So cartridge conduction. Oh, sorry. Cardiac conduction hearing aid uh, cannot apply for the severe uh, hearing impaired, but moderated impaired, uh, moderated impaired hearing patient uh, can use this uh, hearing aid. And also, uh, for the patient with atresia of the canal, is useful this hearing aid. Uh, atresia means that, like uh, this figure. So the patient uh, occluded uh, with a soft tissue in the canal, like this. So in this case, the sound does not pass the canal, but the vibrate transmit in it. So in this case, uh, the performance of the hearing level is very so good. So close to the bone conduction hearing aid. The third one is the application of the, for the sensor neural hearing loss. So, uh, describe first uh, sensor neural hearing loss can hear the sound, can hear the sound, but cannot identify the word. This figure shows uh, intelligibility, and this is the uh, 10 most uh, collected hearing, hear hard monosyllable, and this is the 10 least collected uh, hear hard monosyllable. For example, Japanese monosyllable E, this is E, 90% uh, patient can identify the word. On the other hand, de, this is de, de, uh, only 10% only was corrected. So, uh, what makes this difference? What makes this difference? So, previously, many kind of the parameter was introduced. For example, voice onset time, VOT, in the 
time length of the consonant. On the other hand, speech intelligibility index is a sound to noise ratio in the critical band and sound uh, after passing the uh, speech weight and uh, hearing level weight. So SII is very good relationship uh, with the speech intelligibility. And third, third one is the loudness. Loudness is a perceived uh, sound pressure level. So uh, these parameter is, uh, all these parameter is based on the function of the peripheral, peripheral load, so until the inner ear. But sensory near hearing loss have the disease in the upper stage for, I mean, the auditory nerve. So we have to introduce also the processing in the auditory nerve. So we saw uh, in this case, we propose the autocorrelation analysis for speech. So autocorrelation is uh, processing in the auditory nerve for the temporal analysis, and uh, autocorrelation is uh, correlation with uh, original uh, sound and uh, the sound uh, with the delay time as a function of the delay time. So, and uh, Professor Ando proposed the tau e, effective duration tau e. Effective duration tau e means uh, uh, ACF decayed until the 0 0.1. This is tau e. So, I want to use the tau e for the predict the intelligibility of sensor near hearing loss. This is an example. Uh, this window is uh, 80 milliseconds. So, in the, uh, this waveform is a monosyllable, sa, Japanese monosyllable, sa. Uh, in, this, uh, in this position, the ACL becomes like this. And uh, in this position, so Bowell position, uh, ACL uh, changes like this. So, tau e is quite different. In the consonant part, tau e is very short. On the other hand, in the bowel part, tau e become longer. So this is uh, uh, tau e as a function of time. Time is uh, this one, as a function of time. So uh, for example, Japanese uh, monosyllable ki, medium value of tau e is uh, 73. On the other hand, uh, Japanese monosyllable mu have the uh, medium value of the tau e uh, uh, 39. So every uh, monosyllable has different value of the tau e. Okay, last one, last one. This is a relationship of the intelligibility with the parameter. So every parameter, uh, almost parameter does not fit the uh, uh, percept, uh, percent articulation, but only tau e median has a good relationship with the perce uh, percent articulation of the sensory neural hearing loss. It means that tau e is very uh, explained well about the uh, intelligibility of the sensor neural hearing loss. Uh, conclusion. So we, uh, first we present three problems. For the first and the second problem, we have developed new hearing aid. And the third problem, uh, we, we want to propose a digital signal processing including SGF, but it is uh, the future uh, works maybe. Thank you very much. Much kind attention. Okay. Sorry, I have no time to questions. So let's start next present. Uh, next presenter is uh, Nicola Prodi. The title is Using Time in the Evaluation of effort, Effortful Speech Recognition. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be here. And now we'll spend this time to discuss with you the usage of time in the evaluation of effort, effortful speech recognition. So the outline, moment. Uh, we, have a, we will go through the effects of noise on attention and cognitive processes, so we have a kind of broad perspective. Then we will stress the need for easy listening experience as a prerequisite for good, uh, good outcome in the tasks. Then we will 
introduce the framework, the theoretical framework for effort listening, and then uh, deal with measures, current measures, and focus on the application of response time in some of the experiences that we had in the last years. And then I let you with some literature to make some, uh, you know, some more precise uh, information given. So the basic mechanisms deal with distraction of divided attention. This means that uh, when you have an audit in, uh, several tasks, you have auditory tasks and non-auditory tasks, then uh, noise can uh, hamper this allocation, and uh, this is the distraction of memory uh, of attention. Sorry. Then there is the impact of the coding of the signal. Uh, of course, this is about working memory that we will see later on. And this is a mechanism that uh, is at the core of the recognition of speech, so it's quite important for us. And then there is other uh, mechanism of intrusion, which are dealing with the, uh, what happens when noise enters the procedures of exchange of information between the parts of uh, elaboration, elaboration units. But in particular, we will see this uh, functioning of our cognitive uh, processes you, from the input here. Here, you have, sorry, inputs here. Then you have these elaboration stages, then you have the outputs and feedbacks, and you see that attention is mainly the controller of this process. And you have all of the components that may be uh, intruded by noise. So it's quite important to understand a little more what happens here and what are the more vulnerable components. For instance, we go back to the attention. What happens is that you know, the automatic processes are disturbed, we are already seen that the, the uh, resources are distracted. There are serious effects on most structured tasks and those which are not customary. Please consider that I'm not speaking in of any particular task. Then we will focus on speech recognition in particular, because this is actually what we are most interested in in this case. In this case. So the main ca causes are silent noise events, unexpected noise events, and higher level noise, so the max level noise. These are, are very harmful for attention. This is well known, of course, but helps us in focusing better on what I will say you later on. And of course, the, the linked with that is the probability of us absence from the correct activity. So I'm distorted, so I, I just almost quit from the current activity, which is very, very um, dangerous for many types of activities. When we go to, not just to attention, but to the structure, the working memory, this is a model from literature from Baddeley, uh, adapted from Elbrook. You see that this is the controller again, but you have more, uh, it's identified here, some parts of the working memory, which deal with, for instance, with recognition of language. So the units are here, you have rehearsal, and you have comparison with the long-term memory, and this is the, 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 the loop that works when you have to, to recognize speech, basically. So you have parsing of the input, then you go to the long-term memory and match and build candidates, and then choose candidates to assign the meaning. It's very complex, and unfortunately, this is very subject to the intrusion of noise. In particular, we see of fluctuating and speech. And in particular, you see uh, it happens a traffic jam in the access to the working memory because the noise has access to the resources of working memory. So the signal has to wait to enter, and so the system is in the traffic jam. And of course, there is a, a stronger impact from amplitude fluctuating character, especially those resembling speech. This is because speech has a direct entrance to the working memory. You cannot control that. If you hear speech around and you are attending a task, then speech goes in. 
and you are not able, unless you're very much trained, to disentangle the speech from your task. Or you have to put a lot of attention of your task to get rid of the speech. For instance, in the school, this means that you need more processing by the pupils to recognize the signal, and you have exhausting of the, of the resources. And uh, of course, if the, the, the noise has a meaning, you have effects on comprehension and elaboration of text. You have delays in the writing skill and, uh, and, uh, and uh, acquisition of, of, uh, of reading. And there are cumulative disadvantages. This is very well known from the literature, but uh, gives you an idea that from the basic mechanism, you have directly an, an output on the task, for instance, in schools. So what shall we do? What can we do with this type of, of uh, widespread intrusion of noise during the uh, cognitive processes and speech recognition in particular? Well, it is possible, well, let's, let's specify it a bit, a bit better, how to design remedies without making complex task-specific uh, experiments. You know, comprehension tests, working memory tests, reading tests, span tests, there are a lot of psychology tests, let's say, to qualify the amount of intrusion. But these are not designed to be linked to design remedies. No, but we would also like to design some remedies and we need a, a different approach. And uh, we have one point of contact, which is that only when listening is not difficult. So if listening can be qualified, we will specify it better as, a, as an easy process. Then you have release of, uh, of resources for other processing. So even for, for the recognition of the meaning of the speech or other tasks at hand. So this is also, this has been uh, better specified theoretically by Ige, and he said that uh, this is an essential prerequisite. But there is no conventional metrics that gives you uh, the amount of easiness of a listening experience. So we can go, and this is, well done in the, in the recent years, to go the other way around. So how can we say when speech is effortful? So we have to find a theoretical approach and then a practical qualification to see and to describe the effortful listening. So what is listening effort? This is the starting point. And this is a very important issue that has a, a long experience now but even though just last year there has been a consensus on the definition of this quantity, after dozens of papers and researches, we will have some in, in, in later on. And the terminology is also important. So you focus on this chart, you have a lot of terms, and agreement of terms is the first uh, thing to do, because this is a highly trans... Um, uh, you know, cross subject between audiology, psychology, acoustics. There are a lot of people involved, psychologists. So, effort has to deal, to deal with deliberate allocation of resources to overcome obstacles in goal pursuit with kind of other task. This is this refers to a model of capacity allocation, which we will see later on, and this is then specified in the listening task. So you have allocation, you have resources, you have also the term arousal, which has psychophysics activation and attention. So we have to borrow these concepts if we want to make some engineering, which has a solid perception-based approach. This is no, no, no way to do without that. And of course, we get more into it and this is the model of capacity by Kahneman, which is specified as the framework for understanding uh, effortful listening. You have the input-related demands that as source factors, transmission factors, maybe room acoustics is within this. It's a small slice. Room acoustics is just a small slice. Then you have the hearing impairment. You have the measured factors, psycholinguistics, for instance, here. 
you have context, cultural and uh, visual scene, then you enter the system, you have automatic responses as the system enters. If it's a, if a, a very interesting thing, then you have high arousal and uh, attention, intentional or automatic attention that goes to the allocation policy and in your numerous several tasks you have attend, then you put your attention and your resources on that specific task because you are attending it very much because it's very interesting. But the same message, if it's not so interesting, then you don't allocate energy at all. Then you have a feedback here, and typically, if you put a lot of effort and you don't get the gist of what is said, then you quit this and you have no, uh, no resources allocated anymore. So this is an highly dynamic thing. And how to qualify with some quantities this uh, complex system? So you see the outputs. You have automatic arousal responses. This is under our conscious control. For instance, poop dilation, skin conductance, cardiac responses. And you have other set of attention-related responses, which are, again, cognitive behavioral, and we will focus on reaction time, but you have also some brain things, and you have autonomic nervous system, which is more, uh, more uh, unconscious, is, is actually unconscious, but pupil dilation, again, this is very important because you have um, a direct access to the mental effort, and then also you can describe by self report So there is a number of measures, but none of them gives you the whole picture. They are able to give a part of the picture, may have potential to shade light on some specific uh, types of intrusion, of mechanisms, but as you can see here, we would like to have control over one factor and to have output control from a single factor, which is not possible. You cannot have this one-to-one -one matching because the system is too complicated. So what we can reasonably do and to find correlations under control conditions. And what we actually had done in the last years is to focus on maybe the most simple of these quantities, which is response time, and has some good properties. For instance, it, it, this is the definition. You have a auditory stimulus, and then you have the response, and you take the speed of the speed the, the time, and it's a direct measure of speed of processing. This is from the 60s, that is done also in speech recognition, but it's speed of processing, literally. Yeah. It's incomprehensive, it can be improved by merging with other measures to, to cover this multifaceted contrast, construct, which is this in effort. You have no insight on what is uh, uh, happening in detail. But you, you can use both in single and dual task. Okay, there are a, a fairly large number of studies, so it's 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 good indicator. And the, the funny thing is that it's relatively easy to collect, but you you need a lot of post processing anyway, hmm? because it's highly subjective variable, and you need specific statistics for that. It's much easier to get this than pupil dilation, for instance, or skin conductance, because this is, you know, the, 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 the merit of things is, is like that. So let's go through, through three applications. We have a system for data collection. This is a, a, a smartphone. This is typically speech intelligibility test that we would say speech recognition test. You have a cat, Matt, and none of the two. You hear the, the, the speaker. The next word I will say is cat, and you say Matt, so you are wrong, and etc. You have this is for the kids, vino e fino, uh, pino e vino, and there is confusion, and then many times many words, and you make statistics out of that. And together with this, of course, you can take the response time, which is the very I mean special thing about this thing. It's not the speech intelligibility test. So first application is. Uh, bit strange thing, but it's interesting, is a very big new church with a very good sound system here. Five positions, alter, uh, of some data here, 
And we also made this uh, speech recognition tests. And the funny thing is that this is response time from testers. This is with sound system and without sound system. Of course, the time gets slower, so you have shorter time to receive the information. And there is some points where you have the same speech transmission index, so almost the same percentage of words, but it takes you far less time to get them. So you won't see this with speech intelligibility tests. So the speech intelligibility alone is under evaluation of the performance. No matter, no, no way, this is 100% sure. Uh, how would you call this? We call it release from effort. So this is a quality that you give to a part of the system, which is the sound system. And maybe another sound system will not give these results. So this is the first type of application. And actually, if you make comparison, a very crude, not, not very sophisticated thing, but this is, the improvement is bigger than all of the rest. So actually, this sound system has the primary effect of decreasing the response time, not to increase the intelligibility, which is a bit crazy, but this is how it works. Second application in the schools, you have uh, with uh, six and seven years old pupils, so with images, very funny, and uh, the two conditions with very good acoustics. This is extremely good, and this is not bad. Uh, maybe 80% intelligibility, we see later on. You have four uh, chunks of test. The first two with A and SSN, and then this is a repetition. So four chunks, two blocks. First block and second block. And what happens from one block to the other? It happens that if you have intelligibility, of course, this is best condition, this is noisy condition. You have always a decrease with the noise, but you have no cha change from one first two tests and second two tests. No? You have just the effect of noise, both for six years and seven years. You have very simple statistics. Just noise factor is significant. This is speech intelligibility. But funny, when you go to response time, you have age, no significant noise, it's significant from here to here. But then test repetition is significant. And it's significant if you have the noisy condition. So if you have the noisy condition from the first two tests to the second two tests, the response time increases. And most interesting is the interaction. You don't have this thing if there is no noise. This means that noise has a direct impact on concentration of the pupils. If it were, uh, I mean, learning effects, it would be shorter, of course. So this is loss of concentration, which is a different thing, the opposite thing, we would say. So this system is able to, to highlight this effect. We already seen this with uh, older people, eight, nine, and, and 10 years, but also with six and seven years, this is what happens. And it happens on a shorter time, because it's just half an hour. With uh, older people, we will see it in 45 minutes. Well, last application, maybe I have still, okay. Uh, the effect of fluctuating noise, we have speech-shaped noise continuous as fluctuating noise. We have simulation of a lecture room. We have conditions of signal-to-noise ratio. And we make some testing with system in a virtual chamber. You see that intelligibility is the same for both noises on the 47 testers. Here we have a short-term uh, STI. But then response time gives you this picture and tells you that to have the same intelligibility, you always need a longer time uh, rather than with the stationary signal. Okay, so creating noise calls for more elaboration because of the mechanisms of 
intrusion to the working memory processes. And this is very important because in everyday life, this type of noise is much more common than stationary noise. No, bubble noise is like that, and depending on the number of speakers. So it's very important also for public spaces. This is what I think. And there is, you know, this bias is almost constantly independent on the conditions. So concluding remarks, I will just, uh, yeah. and then we have some literature, if you like, on chat, of course, it's non-exhaustive. There are a lot of papers interesting on these things, but uh, this point out some of the things that I try to sum up. And, and that's it, thank you. Uh, we have a short time. Uh, do you have a short, quick question on the floor? Excuse me. Second experiment. Okay. But this happens just from the noise condition. It would it would be boring. Also, the other condition would be having the same thing. Yes, it's the impact of noise on the allocation of attention of the pupils. It's distraction process, basically. Because the, the, the intelligibility is very high. So there is not a lot, not much loss of information. And this is our interpretation. Okay, the other one. Uh, the acoustics affects the response time as a whole. It's not tied to some material. It's not a, 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 a an acoustical design parameter. It's a, a design parameter to understand the perception of the speech, uh, speech uh, delivering in this case. Other question? Okay, thank you for uh, presentation, Nicola. <laughs> so next presentation is uh, from the Federica uh, Morandi. The title is Envelope Extraction uh, for Early Decay Estimation, a Subjective Survey. Good morning. So I'm Federica Morandi. I work in the Department of Industrial Engineering. And uh, this morning I will show you and discuss with you some results of a listening test we've been performing in our laboratory um, relative to the perception of reverberance. When one has to deal with the, percep the perceived reverberance, of course, the master uh, work is represented by the paper by Atal, Atal Schroeder, and Sessler. 1965, where they basically made a perception, a listening test and showed that the perceived reverberance was related to either the very first part of the energy decay, or they proposed to constrain the time interval in which to evaluate the slope of the energy decay to 160 milliseconds. Um, a few years later, Jordan proposed the, the, the definition of the EDT, so the evaluation of the slope of the energy decay in the first 10 decibels, including the 
the early uh, reflection uh, zone, time area, let's say. And if on one side we have to consider the definition, what is the definition of these parameters, on the other side another discussion is related to what is the determination of these parameters. So in 1965 Schroeder published the more than famous paper about the Schroeder's backward integration method. Um, so in this case these parameters would be evaluated on an energy decay curve. Uh, Griesinger, since 1993, uh, uh, claims that maybe for the evaluation of the very first part of the end of the decay of the impulse response, this method is not the best suited to determine the, um, the energy decay, and so proposed other solutions. So the, the debate is still open. Um, two of the two most important ranking um, models for um, architectural acoustics include reverberation, uh, as the subsequent vibration or as EDT, and so it's a very important parameter, of course, to see what's the perception related to this uh, criterion. And in the last 20 years, um, much attention has been paid on the uh, use of envelope instead of backward integration, energy decay curve. Why is that? So the first study may be run by Sato and Daka that date back to 1998. Uh, here I just put the, um, a recent work by Brian Katz and Paul Luiter. Um, they basically just showed that if I have multi-slope decays, maybe uh, the Schroeder's integral is not, um, does not fit the impulse response. We're not talking about what the Schroeder in Schroeder's integral means here. Just like from the visual point of view and the perceptual point of view, we see that um, the backward integration has a drawback, which is uh, it suffers from the inertia because it's a cumulative energy uh, integration. And so it accumulates energy from the tail to the beginning of the, impu of the impulse response. And if I have an abrupt change in the slope of my energy decay, maybe due to some very strong reflection at the beginning of the impulse response or a double slope decay as in this case, then the backward integration is not very sensitive to that. Of course, it's got its physical meaning, so the question that uh, Katz was trying to answer is, um, is there a perception threshold for which the backward integration is not um, sensitive? Um, and here we're getting close to the topic of this talk. Um, Simona de Cesaris, uh, which is the co-author of this memory, uh, for her PhD, she studied um, a method to determine the, um, the pre-processed energy, energy detection method following a previous work by Dario Dorazio. Um, and the result of the method is this envelope that we see today in, the, in this picture. We have a, a real impulse, a measured, measured impulse response, and we see that the backward integration method uh, returns the dotted line, while the envelope returns the solid line. Uh, from here, it's clear that basically, if we consider just a reverberation time, the two curves return the same results. If we consider the EDT, the two parameters return different, very different results. And that is because of this uh, inertia that the Schroeder backward integration method brings with this definition. And so the question is, of course this method was proposed, but the question is, is there a correlation between the perceived reverberance and the definition of EDT that comes together with this new proposed method? To answer to this question, of course, we had to perform a listening test. And so uh, we chose to perform a one-sided pairwise comparison test. So basically, uh, we had several assessors. They were subject to two stimuli. And this test, with this procedure that I will talk to you about, um, was aimed at determining whether there was a difference between these two methods, these two parameters, and so to um, support the use of this envelope in the evaluation of the early decay time. Why this test? So uh, we, we chose to go for a one-sided test because we knew a priori where we were going to. Um, we knew that this method would return, for some cases, a smaller EDT, and so we knew that the perceived reverberation, the reverberance was supposed to be sl um, lower. Uh, from the statistical point of view, the only difference, it depends on the number of assessors, basically. So the point is that we started with 70 assessors, now we have more than 100, and so we're hoping that increasing the number of assessors, we will be able to, um, to test with other combination these results. Uh, this test is a first choice test, so the assessor did have to respond anyway. It was not uh, admitted to say, I don't know the answer, or I'm not sure. And of course, when you have to do this test, you have to um, set some risks, some false 
uh, negative rate, some, uh, some false positive rate, and these are basically the test parameters we chose um, to set the experiment. Test setup. The test was performed in this listening chamber. It's in our laboratory in the Department of Industrial Engineering, and uh, it's compliant to the I21116. And as you can see, it has two sliding panels, the OSB panels, which allow to produce a, a reflectionless zone beyond the, um, uh, the listener. Um, and the loudspeakers are just beyond the. the The screen. <laughs> Thanks. Um, before the test, the test was completely anonymous, and this was very helpful for the people that were participating. Uh, they were they had to answer a questionnaire. The questionnaire investigated about their date, sex, age, profession, hearing impairment, noise exposure during uh, work time, during daytime, and what kind of noise they were exposed to, traffic or specific kinds of noise. Uh, they were naive assessors, so they didn't have any specific training in, uh, in listening tests. Uh, but we asked them what, were, what was their experience, and then we also asked them to rate on a five-point scale their musical attitude, because many were maybe musician or audio, um, had an experience in audio editing, mastering, and that was important to, to, to know. And then they were read some instructions, and that was, was very helpful for us because we had a paper and we read the same instruction to, the, to all the people. And so we knew that they were given the same amount of information. And in this instruction, we defined what is reverberation time. We didn't talk about EDT or perceived reverberation time. What is reverberation time? Doing examples. How do you feel in a church? How do you feel in a recording studio? We did describe the test and explained about the two alternative force choice so the fact that they had to answer somehow. Uh, they could add comments. Uh, so they had to answer, but then if they were not sure or if they wanted to highlight something, they could add some comments. And this was actually a very important part because every people uh, used different um, ways to detect what was his feeling of reverberance. Then we had a training session. So basically we made the listen to six pairs of tracks the first pair of track was like church and recording studio, so they could totally tell the difference. The second pair of tracks was more delicate, like Italian Opera House, uh, two impulse responses, one with the uh, source on the fourth stage and one with the source in the center of the stage. So it was not slight, but still it was getting closer to what the test would have been. And the third pair was one of the couple of stimuli that they would have listened in the test. And so they were uh, helped to recognize. Um, so, we had couples of, imp the stimuli were couples of impulse, impulse responses convolved with short anechoic recordings. Um, we chose in particular these two recordings, uh, they're clarinets, one is from Mozart Opera Don Giovanni and the other is from Bruckner Symphony, number eight. And um, it was very important that the tracks were really short in time, because otherwise people uh, lose attention and find it very difficult to correlate between the two um, uh, pieces, the two tracks. And more than that, the test was not supposed to last very long, because otherwise people would lose attention, and so the test more or less lasted 20 to 30 minutes, including the instruction phase. Um, so the anechoic motifs were recorded in Alto University and they were chosen for two reasons. First, because they m were expected to have a small tau -E value. And secondly, because, um, because uh, the choice of the impulse responses was very difficult. And so we wanted to have uh, anechoic recordings we had, which had a very specific content in different octave bands. And the reason is because since we had to, to tell the difference between reverberation time and EDT calculated with Schroeder's method and reverberation time and EDT calculated with the new method, um, we needed to have couples of impulse responses that follow this scheme. Um, and this, of course, was very difficult to get in one octave band. You can imagine how impossible it would have been to have it over the whole spectrum. So we had two couples of impulse responses. And the two impulse responses had the same reverberation time with Schroeder's integral, the same EDT calculated over the Schroeder's integral, energy decay curve, the same reverberation time if calculated with a new method, 
but a very different EDT, EDT if calculated with the new method. Uh, when I say different, I mean we, okay, we consider the JND as different, as, uh, of course. Uh, I was so like, as you can see here, this is for instance two uh, um, impulse responses we measured in the Mazzini theater. Um, we wanted to make the test over real impulse responses, not to have um, synthesized impulse responses. And we luckily could do that because we've been carrying out this huge research project on the acoustic characterization of opera houses, and so we had a, a great availability of impulse responses. And the two I showed you before were taken in the Mazzini Theater, which is the one on the top of the, of the picture, in two boxes. And so there were real impulse responses. So as we said, we had two couple of stimuli and they were presented in a listening room and at each assessor we asked which one of the two stimuli is more reverberant. So if they could assess that the one with the lower EDT calculated with the new method was less reverberant, then we could demonstrate that this works. So let's go for a listening test. I hope nobody's playing outside because otherwise that would make it different. So I will let you listen to two tracks and then I will ask you which is the more reverberant. Is it possible to, yeah, I think it's. Okay, I'll try again with some more. <laughs> okay. Here it's very difficult because <laughs> it's not a neutral <laughs> listening room. Uh, who would say that, is it more reverberant the first, who would say that the first track is more reverberant? Okay, who would go for the second one? Okay. And these are the results. <laughs> no, it's very difficult here to detect the difference because uh, it, it was difficult in the listening room, but uh, here it's more than difficult. So the track of couples, uh, the um, couple of tracks we just listened to was the one highlighted with this mark. And we see that the first uh, track had an EDT, which was basically half the EDT uh, we had for the second, uh, for the second one. Uh, that was very difficult here. So, I'll show you some results. Um, okay, since we had set this um, threshold as alpha risk, beta risk, and we wanted to have a proportion of people that could assess the difference that was greater than 40%, we needed to have at least 67 assessors. Uh, by the time we completed this um, statistical analysis, we had 74 assessors, but now we passed almost 100 assessors, and so we, are to, uh, we have to evaluate other um, statistical analysis. Um, 42 males and 31 females, and the age, you can see it here, so it was quite, um, well, mixed. Of course, we had a predominance of people that was around to complete their university study, but uh, not totally, not only students, that was. Um, and these are the results of the questionnaires we made, so we asked them to assess the, the sensitivity to sound, and of course, we didn't just say, how much are you sensitive to sound? We provided some tables so that they could identify themselves in some categories. Um, so we had uh, five professional musicians, harder with co moderate confidence with music, two assessors declared to have hearing impairments and they were not considered. 
The results showed that uh, six of, for five of the six tracks did pass the uh, test. So for five out of six cases, the minimum number of assessors required to say that there was a difference between the two things was uh, achieved. Um, and we can see the results a bit better here. So we can see that, for instance, in to the right, we have a plot that, uh, a graph that plots the minimum number of consensual, of consensual responses that were required to pass the test. And the red line is the line that uh, states how many assessors did manage to, um, to detect this difference. And of course, we see that in one case, so the second track, we just passed the test by uh, maybe one assessor, and the only test that didn't pass this uh, test was a couple AB uh, with a Bruckner uh, melody at 100, 1000 hertz. And to the right, we can see that uh, we can see, be 95% sure that at least 20% uh, of this population can detect this difference for the left hand uh, tracks, while for the right hand tracks, more than I think we heard uh, the we heard the fifth. So for this track, we just heard the results were that at least 60% of the population was able to detect a difference and to say that with this new method, um, there was a perceptive relevance of calcula in calculating EDT with uh, the envelope instead of with the uh, Schroeder's backward integral. To go to the conclusions, quickly. Um, we've been talking about the definition of EDT and how still nowadays is discussed, the thing that maybe for the very first part of the decay, the critical zero to minus five uh, decibel or minus 10 decibel, the definition is still an open uh, debate. We've been performing the subjective tests uh, on listening with some uh, interesting features. So we use listening chambers, we use measure impulse response, which is not that um, that common for this kind of tests, uh, and we did manage to collect a great number of assessors. Uh, the results show that with the EDT calculated with the envelope was closely related to the perceived verb branch and more related to the perceived verb branch than the Schroeder's integration method. And the future work, of course, uh, there are some things that we need to work on, update the results, need to evaluate more complex sound because now we had really a specific short sound of single instruments. What if the a mix of instruments are uh, together. Do I perceive the difference or not? And then the third criticality I would say is that, of course, we just checked that in the impulse response we showed, the reverberation time and the EDT were the same. But of course, in this, we are hypothesizing that there's no dependence on the other, on other criteria. Uh, so this is another topic to be further investigated. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have a short one question or comment? Yes, Professor. No, we had the cliff type decay because in Italy we had the, the measurement we used were uh, recorded in the um, uh, were acquired in the Italian historical opera houses, and when you have the say, the stage on the uh, the source on the stage, then you always have a very uh, strong direct sound and some early reflection, but the slope in general is like. On the side. Uh, you see in this one? Uh, actually, uh, if you. I don't have. Yeah, if you look at the impulse response, the shape is. Uh, it's much like this. I think this is, was okay in the Mazzini Theater, so the one where we did all the tests. But if you see, like, there's a very, uh, very strong early refraction, but then the decay is not, is almost not like plateau type decay. Then, of course, if you validate the plateau type decay over the Schroeder's integral, then you might have it if you have, like, the source on the pit, in the pit. But if you have it on the stage, in our experience, it's more like a cliff type decay. And then, of course, of course. And in fact, the, the study by Katz, uh, they studied uh, if we have a, a double slope decay, uh, to which extent, so what is the JND that I have in the case of a double slope decay, but all, always with the cliff type decay? It could be very interesting to, to try to see if this uh, feature can be detected with other kind of decays. 
Okay. Thank you again. So, um, can I to go to the next? Thank you. Our next presenter is Leonardo Gabrielli. The title is The, the Recent Shift in the Machine Hearing from Engineer Future to Time Domain Low Audio Processing. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm Leonardo Gabrielli from Università Politecnica delle Marche. I'm a postdoc there, and um, I will try to be as um, general as possible in this talk and give you a, a brief introduction about um, the recent shift in machine learning and machine listening. Um, I will give you mainly a basic background and then, if I have some time, give you some results and applications. So, my first argument is, can we build an artificial auditory system? Um, then I will review current methods used in machine hearing, uh, give you some examples, and then uh, explore some new trends uh, that go into the direction I am pointing at. So um, there's many of you that know very well the human auditory system. I am not an expert on this, but I know uh, three uh, very simple things. Um, I know that there's um, in the inner ear, we have sort of processing, free time frequency processing. I know that this signal goes to biological neural networks uh, that provide learning during our um, uh, very early childhood. And I know that is able to perform a lot of different auditory tasks. So my, the, the question is, can we build a computational model to uh, provide artificial hearing? Um, and, and this should be able to um, provide us uh, good results in several tasks, like speech recognition, polyphonic music transcription, uh, e events, um, rear sound events detection, like uh, detecting a, a baby crying, uh, glass breaking, and so on, or even sound design, which is a very complex task, anything related to audition. And these tasks should be uh, performed all at the same time by the same sort of auditory system. Um, this field is called machine hearing or machine listening and is very new um, uh, field of research. And uh, it deals with all these algorithms that are meant to uh, provide an understanding of uh, an audio um, content by a machine. And, uh, and Part of the researchers in this field seeks for a unified model, although not, not everyone. Um, so I'll give you a brief introduction on uh, how this architecture works at the moment. Uh, it's mainly based on neural networks. Um, okay. Um, uh, these are algorithms that employ inputs um, to provide us predictions or classification uh, that are compared to ground truth labels uh, to measure an error, which is then used to uh, train the network and improve step by step. Uh, this is a supervised approach, which is the most simple uh, maybe to explain now. Uh, and it relies on features, so numbers, let's say, that are extracted from one or multiple audio sources and uh, contextual information. And this is usually based on traditional DSP techniques. Uh, what are these features and what they do like? Um, we have spectral information and end engineer features. These are uh, two different uh, approaches, actually. So spe by spectral information, I mean everything related to frequency or time frequency. So I'd say like STFT, which is very elegant as a solution, and it, it, it does not lose any information in principle. But it has a lot of free parameters that influence the results, like how do you, uh, the, the Fourier uh, beans, uh, the hop size, and so on, and is not really psychoacoustically motivated. Uh, there are variations of it, like the cost, a constant Q, STFT, and other uh, psychoacoustically motivated ones, and then, well, we can use mag and phase, magnitude only, and so on. And then there's uh, other features 
this work very well in the speech domain, like malfrequencies, uh, capstral coefficients, which are more uh, psychoacoustically oriented and they um, compress the information very efficiently. But they lose some accuracy. And then we have other transform I want to, and I won't go into that. And then we have end engineer features. This may, um, there, there's a whole world of, of end engineering the features. Uh, you could extract envelopes, uh, measure the zero crossing rate, uh, measure energy, uh, or you could um, do frequency domain stuff like spectral flux, spectral centroid, uh, calculate the pitch, of course, and all sorts of stuff. And if you have multiple sources, you can have uh, time difference of arrival, GCC coefficients, so some uh, spatial measuring, and then you have also context data. And then you can do post-processing of this, so mainly statistical processing, but also some uh, signal processing, like derivatives of the signals. So there's a, a bunch of numbers you provide to the neural network, and these are very, it takes uh, a long time to uh, say, tell which are the good ones for a specific task. What if we can learn these features? So avoiding all this guessing, um, we, we can uh, provide some means uh, for the network to learn these features by um, evaluating the error as we have seen beforehand. I'll give you just one example of this, um, which is very popular. Uh, convolutional neural networks employ um, several layers, which are called convolutional, which generally work on two-dimensional images, signals, so images, and they, uh, conv uh, they do convolutions along this, the image uh, to collect feature maps that then are subsampled. And the nice thing is that the filters you use for the convolution has learnable kernels. So the learning provides you this mean to uh, collect uh, features. Uh, in the image field, it works very well. And uh, since this is a hierarchical way of representing your signal, um, like I show you, when you input faces to the network, you see that the first levels, um, so these are all these boxes here. The, the, the first kernels uh, learn to represent edges of the image. And then on the more uh, inner layer, they start representing parts of the faces and then the entire faces. So they really fit to the task at hand, which is the task of understanding faces. Um, this is a nice solution because it's very elegant and it reduces the time of developing your DSP algorithms with trials and error. But it has some disadvantage, uh, disadvantages too, like often the computational cost is very high and not so accurate in some generation tasks, I will show you later. And we don't always understand what they learn. In the audio field, uh, we mainly use spectrograms, um, which mm, are not so intuitive as images. Uh, and it is not intuitive for us sometimes, but not for the network as well. Um, so this is just a pipe, uh, an organ, a pipe organ sound is not very informative. So I will go into this with just one example. Um, it, this computational sound design is a sort of topic I'm uh, starting at the moment. And the aim of this topic is to get the sound designer as close as possible to uh, the result he's looking for. And we need this neural network to listen carefully to the, to the sound. This is the architecture. Um, we are using recently. It's a convolutional neural network, as I shown before, with a spectrogram as input of a target sound. It provides us some uh, parameters that are fed to a physical model that is able to re synthesize the, sound, the original signal so that the reconstructed signal should be as close as possible to the input signal. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is what we obtain from this. Uh, we use a convolutional neural network and we get sort of nice estimate of, of the sound. So you see that the big dots and the X 
on the plot, they are the target and the regenerated sounds. They sort of match, but not perfectly, and you can also look at the time domain. But if we use end engineered features, we have a much nicer match. So what do we get from this? Um, we see that the convolutional approach is kind of nice and it works, but it's not perfect. So end engineered features give us uh, very uh, more uh, accurate results. Um, but I want to point something out of this. Um, what if we adapt the engineered features, uh, so the second network, the one on the right, to another task, like onset detection, you know, uh, detecting uh, key press on, uh, on a musical instrument, and we get very bad results compared to the convolutional approach. Uh, these, these are just uh, a few tests we, we did. Um, so they, the, the numbers may change a bit, but not too much. Um, so the convolutional approach provides a more generalized uh, way to represent uh, musical data. And the, uh, but we can go uh, further and say that the, uh, this um, approach, um, uh, I mean, this is just a starting point. We took the convolutional approach from the image field, but it, this is not all we can do. Uh, like, um, until recently, nobody even realized that uh, they shouldn't uh, use square kernels for convoluting the spectrograms, but they should use vertical, I mean, like very rectangular kernels on the horizontal and vertical axis. And these are two papers from 2000 and uh, from, from this year, and they show that performance is improved. So um, the audio community is still not focusing a lot on how to uh, represent information nicely. And I show you a couple of very nice trends. Recently, uh, Google introduced WaveNet, and the University of Montreal introduced uh, uh, Sample RNN. Uh, which are two um, approaches to represent in a better way the musical data. Um, I need to, this is a PDF, I need to show you a GIF for this, like just. The WaveNet approach used deleted convolution, so these are 1D uh, convolution on the raw audio. And in this way, we can boil down all the information to the upper level to get only the most meaningful stuff. So from here, there's convolution, which are da uh, done in this um, trellis uh, approach. And they are learned as well, like in, in other cases. Uh, then uh, there's another approach which uses a recurrent neural network. I won't go into this, but I just want to show that this approach is hierarchical as well. So all the information is stored at different level and all these tires look at information at different time scales. So they can look at the millisecond time scale and the 100 sec uh, millisecond time scale and so on. This is much more light as a um, computational cost, but we don't have a clue of what's going on because these networks are really not understandable by, by us, by anyone. Um, I'll show you how powerful they are. <coughs> I will show you, um, let's see if it works. Uh, so s some WaveNet examples showing how it l uh, listens to uh, how, uh, some hours of piano music and it tries to um, reproduce it randomly afterwards. J we just give it uh, noisy inputs uh, after it, it finishes its learning. Just play another one. Yes. Okay, so the network just started playing some random music without any uh, conditioning, so we don't give it any information and it's repeats some uh, stuff that it learns, but in a creative way. And it does also with speech. So if we give the network hours of speech to listen to, 
that's what it does. Dang. The two to take now also very good. Sugar Oxford, seed cells, guys. Around you. He has a hatching with going to fifty servers a pack. So there's no vocoding here. The network just uh, outputs one sample at a time and provides us a raw audio signal that is very um, impressive and, and realistic. So they learn acoustic features and they even learn the evolution up to a one second scale. So in the piano sounds we see that it can learn some, it can create some melody and then it starts changing, then there's some melody and then it starts pushing all the keys. But uh, so th there's some works, uh, some work that is, that we must, uh, that people must do to improve this, but uh, this is very interesting. But why and how this happens, we don't have a clue. So we need to get an understanding of current results and then build on top of this and stop experiments on animals. Oh, sorry, on computers. Because machine learning people tend to do a lot of experiments on computers and uh, they, they need to think a bit more. I, I take it as a, it is a, a must for me as well. And foster interdisciplinary research, get inspiration from biological systems, uh, and embed DSP with machine learning, because the convolutional approaches we are seeing so far, they make use heavily on DSP knowledge. But most of the times they don't match together because just machine learning people and DSP researchers come from different uh, backgrounds. And we must try to make this system as general as possible. So uh, even we, if we don't get the one uh, percent point in our uh, competitions, in our research competitions, um, but if we can manage to um, create a system that works quite nicely on many tasks instead of uh, looking only into one task, then we can really try to build an auditory, uh, artificial auditory system. So, yeah, I, I just um, uh, have a couple of other examples if we have some time. No, we don't have mine. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have a short question from the floor? Ah, yes, please. Mm -hmm. All right, and we, we don't change the STFT, we take the spectrum uh, as in the previous case, but uh, instead of using square, like, uh, I don't know, like three pixel by three, uh, and convolute over the image, we take uh, very uh, thin kernels to span the, the frequency axis to get very meaningful timbral information, or uh, on the horizontal axis to get uh, onset information, bit information, and so on. And then, like, we could have half of the frequency, and so we go on and span the spectrum like this, or the other way around. All right. Okay, uh, no, actually, um, th these are two separate parts of it. So, um, th uh, designing uh, a good STFT for, for this is not um, an option. I mean, uh, you have to do it by trials. Um, or at least, uh, like in, in our sound design example, we use um, quite um, uh, precise uh, Fourier transforms, like, uh, Let's say we use 4K or 8K beans, which is sort of okay, um, because we don't need to have like the precise position of the harmonic peaks, but we have to know quite precisely um, the, the, their amplitude. So we, you have to uh, look for, uh, And the one dimensional approach is better because you don't have to uh, try with the STFT parameters. Okay, thank you, Leonard. So we have short time, so let's go next one. Uh, next presenter is Professor John. The title is HCF Best Scream Classification for the Detecting uh, Hazardous Situations.
Thank you, Rota. Um, I just brought, uh, well, sorry, it's uh, Korean. But to show the whole uh, project, I want to uh, explain this. Yeah, um, these are the people, uh, object for protection. And these are the just situations as a kind of what you can say is uh, criminals. And the, these are the CCTVs. Well, actually this was uh, suggested by a police department and they want to get uh, some other supportive information around the CCTVs. What, what they have, the numbers of CCTVs so is almost uh, about 40,000, the, the public one. So it's, that means 1,000 people for one CC, public CCTVs. But around there, it's, it's, it's only used in during the day and many of the information is just hidden. So uh, they want to find the good service providers uh, to uh, s uh, gathering um, together the multi-log uh, data using many sense, many other sensors, including the smartphones of the the objects. Uh, so uh, this system will be soon built up and the, will be provide for the uh, people of protection and the. Uh, the acoustics will be the one information among 10 of uh, uh, sensor data, but the acoustics uh, uh, system can be used to de detect that and extract many uh, useful information from the, uh, all those uh, uh, environmental conditions. And the, what we should provide is we should uh, have uh, real-time data and then respond to the, about the criminal activities to the um, police department as an emergent uh, incident. So this means we cannot just deliver the large uh, amount of data to the police and then they can analyze. It, it took too much time. So uh, it's more or less at, the, at this part we should do something to uh, minimize the latency. Uh, but the, we, well, the, this is a kind of um, later goal, but the, if you deal with this um, uh, spatial acoustics, you can get some more information. So uh, it can be uh, so considered in the outside condition, also in the room acoustical situations. Uh, but if it's outside, then the, the, this uh, basic information is needed. Like uh, if it's a room, then because this uh, CCTV is always installed in the same positions, so if we have such kind of environmental situation, in other words, uh, noise mapping in outside or the room acoustic, in a, uh, of impulse response, it will be the basic information to control those uh, accidental sounds as, uh, so that we can consider the, the real situation. So, uh, but for outside cases, uh, even though we use um, many other uh, sensors for acoustics, but we need some basic information such as uh, traffic noise levels and uh, uh, this incidental human noise and uh, all other natural sounds. So this, this can be our uh, information. Uh, in this case, um, within this situation, we were asked to uh, detect uh, female uh, screams. Actually, we gathered uh, more than 30 female uh, screams and uh, we could divide three cases. Uh, roughly two case is a non-scream and scream. So uh, you, you can listen to these three screams and you, 
try to find out which one is non screen. <coughs> Sorry for this inconvenience. Uh, uh, well, actually, it was quite stressful to, to gather all those screams and then re re listen to it repeatedly. And uh, as a result, the, the first one is non scream is a, is a kind of a surprise. But the second one is in real case. Well, it's almost real case. If you are real a actress, then you can behave was well, scream like this. Uh, and the third one is, 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 is after the, uh, the crime, crime scene. So it's, it's an acute pain. It's a scream after being assaulted. So the, we could uh, actually define three uh, screen cases and try to uh, define uh, uh, when you when you record the, the through the microphones then you ha you uh, at the real time uh, analysis. So uh, if the screen is just uh, hidden in in noise environmental noise, then how we can detect it. So there, there have been many uh, trials. It's been more than 20, 30 years using uh, uh, this uh, method. Gaussian mixed model is the base one. And recently, as you listen to the previous presentation, we use uh, machine learning and then this F MFCC coefficient and also the other the UBM is, is a useful tool. Uh, so um, I was, we, we were actually um, uh, suggested about the situation in the scenario. Uh, there is a CCTV in, in two different positions and the, in the first position, uh, the object is actually faced uh, the criminal and then run uh, and then finally found the building but the, it is not a safe building and inside eventually the, the, in these three positions this is happening. I mean the, the screams is happening. So, uh, so we should um, evaluate and then, and then also the denoise, uh, the environmental noise, but uh, because there's a uh, lot of noises, we consider uh, trapping noise and and just pink noise, white noise, and human babbling sounds. And in those situations, we first um, uh, pre-filter the the sounds and like to get the, uh, any clues from the filtered one. So if there's any uh, scream-like sounds that remain, then we can actually compare with the reference data and, and the, we, we detect the signals and also to get, uh, uh, train the system. Then finally we can, we like, like to detect the three different kinds of uh, screams. Then we just inform police department, this is case A or B or C. Uh, for pre-filtering, uh, we use different uh, filters. Uh, we also use uh, echo filters for the case of rooms and also de-reverberation filters, but sometimes de-reverberation filters doesn't uh, provide good information for the filtered uh, sound. So uh, we sort of uh, optimize the process and the the position of the filters and also the use or without uh, use the, the case. And for uh, feature extractions, as inf informed in the previous uh, presentation, MFCC is a, a useful one. And the, for the early screen detection, we use uh, GMM and also uh, for, for the uh, information and the increase the, the system efficiency we use uh, uh, case of uh, UVM. Uh, but here, as you listen to three different sounds, the, our main concern at this po uh, point is to 
recognize the, the scream or non-scream. So in case of non-scream, is the amplitude is rather constant. So uh, uh, the 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 person is used uh, well make the scream, but as you can see here, is uh, all different. Uh, frequencies is actually revealed and the constant, but in the real screen case in the origin situations, it's very variant, and then the sounds coming out from different way. And some of the particular frequencies actually activated, but in case of uh, uh, the after case of screen C, it's all just mixed and this case is repeated. So uh, the main, at, at this point, we try to use ACF, autocorrelation function, to recognize the signals. Uh, this is quite useful because even after the filtered case, only there is a kind of very small clue. You can use uh, just uh, these waveform patterns uh, so that you can recognize the different types of screen. So. Uh, I1 and Tau1 is actually uh, tells you about the uh, uh, frequency and its uh, pitch strength. And then Tau E is, as, as the previous uh, cases, is a, is a variant of the waveform patterns. So uh, we try to use this and try to find out. And the uh, screen A cases is, is uh, quite uh, uh, flat. But in scream C cases, tau one and pi one values is higher than the others, and also uh, tau E cases, the scream B, which has got very variant amplitude, it shows um, uh, highest values. And we also investigate uh, sound quality aspects of, about loudness and sharpness, although we we make the same LEQ values, the loudness variation and the sharpness is different. Uh, as we can expect, the, um, the uh, case one, which has got the flat, is because the person, I mean, the, the, the female screamer is just making a same uh, amplitude and use the same, uh, 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 same, uh, uh, same, uh, sound generators, so uh, it, it shows uh, the highest loudness. But in case of variance and uh, expressing agonies, uh, this sharpness is increased. Uh, but in detection of the accuracy of the, the system, we use human, not, not the machine itself. We, we try to uh, find out the reference values of human detection after filtered out whether they can actually perceive uh, the screams remained in the filtered sounds uh, so that we can compare this as a reference to evaluate the, the system recognition. So this perception test uh, is, is one of a valuable tool to evaluate the system. And also, if we can get the binaural recording, then uh, the localization is, is, is a qu quite a good information to uh, catch the, the sounds or source or the uh, crime conditions and situations. But the, at this moment, we are just allowed just recording a monaurally. So, it, this year we, we actually started this project and we just, in the initial stage, and we just, at this point, we just clarify about the classifications of uh, scream and non-screaming. And then the ACF, we found also the ACF is a good tool uh, to, to recognize the different waveforms. And the, we will try to use uh, uh, perception test uh, to uh, uh, to optimize the system. This. Thank you, thank you, Professor John. Do you have a question?
So please. Well, the, the the length of the screen, yeah, yeah is it, the one, and the, and the time window is twen twenty millisecond. Twenty millisecond. Yeah, time window. Mm. It's plus minus twenty millisecond. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. The other question do you have? So please. There's a different approach. Okay. Yeah. okay. So thank you again, Professor John. <laughs> so final presentation in this uh, session. Uh, from the Anna uh, Lobigati. Uh, the title is MIMO uh, Oralizations of Communal Teatro in uh, Bologna. Let's start. Okay, good morning. My name is Anna Rovigatti. I'm from the Acoustic Research uh, Group of the University of Bologna. And today I will present to you uh, one of our work about MIMO oralization of the Teatro Comunale in Bologna. The theater was designed by Antonio Galli da Bibiena in 1756 and was opened at the beginning of the Italian melodrama period. And during uh, its history, the theater was renovated several time, times, and the last renovation was in August 2016, where all the seats uh, of the stalls were replaced. And as suggested, the whole volume and the occupancy of the theater, the theater can be considered uh, an average size uh, Italian opera house. As concerned the acoustic of the theater, it was uh, previously, uh, previously studied and the objective parameters uh, um, suggest that the theater is quite reverberant. So that's why um, the Teatro Comunale was the first theater in uh, Europe, beside the Bayreuth Fitzpelaus, where the Wagner's opera were performed. And uh, that is also why Bologna is called uh, um, Wagnerian city. But uh, what uh, is still missing for a complete evaluation of the acoustic of the theater is a perceptive evaluation. Um, a perceptive evaluation can be uh, realized by a sound immersive experience with the oralization techniques. And according to the recent studies, uh, uh, MIMO oralization uh, is a more realistic method of rendering uh, audible sound fields. And moreover, the computer model calibration is considered uh, a necessary step to achieve uh, a realistic uh, oralization. So, 
our um, normal method that we follow it uh, consists on three step, steps. Uh, the first one uh, uh, in situ measurements uh, according to the standard. Uh, second, uh, an accurate computer model calibration. And finally, uh, the MIMO realization. Uh, concerning the measurement, uh, we had uh, the possibility to measure different configuration of the theater. For example, with and without the wings, uh, closing and opening the orchestra pit, uh, with the far curtain up and down, uh, and with and without the seat uh, of the stools. So that allowed us to collect uh, a large variety of results uh, to carry out uh, uh, an accurate computer model calibration. The measurements uh, were done with the four search position, both on the stage and on the orchestra pit, and uh, a dance mesh of monaural receivers were placed in uh, one half of the audience uh, because of the symmetrical property of the space. Then a computer model was created by using Google SketchUp and then imported in the acoustic simulation software Odeon. The calibration paid particular attention to the input parameters uh, and uh, we assigned to all the material uh, a referred value of absorption coefficient uh, which were taken from uh, the literature da database and the GND from the ISO 3382 was used as combination target thresholds. But uh, what does it mean to do a um, MIMO oralization for an Italian opera house? We know that different uh, acoustic systems exist, uh, for example, single input, single output, uh, where, uh, which is uh, the convolution between, uh, in this case, uh, a mononechoic recording with a, a monoaural uh, um, res impulse response uh, given by omnidirectional search, or for example, a single input, multiple output system that given by uh, the convolution between uh, mono and echoic recordings with um, binaural impulse response given uh, um, by omnidirectional search. Doing a uh, multiple input, multiple output um, oralization means that the convolution is between uh, a uh, sum of uh, mononechoic recordings with a uh, binaural impulse response given by um, the own directivity of the search. So each instrument uh, uh, has its it own directivities. Now I will play to you uh, two very small tracks uh, about uh, the first one, single input, uh, uh, single output, uh, oralization and the second one about memorialization. Oops, you notice the difference. So the first step in the MIMO realization was to choose the seating arrangement of the orchestra and uh, we decided to uh, use um, a normal uh, configuration of the orchestra for Italian opera with the director facing on the stage, the strings placed around him and the brass and then the woodwinds on the left and right sides of the orchestra. All the instruments uh, have um, its own directivity. And uh, we uh, used the multi-channel necoic recordings uh, that was recorded in, um, silent, in the silent room of the University of Bologna. And different motifs from Italian operas were played by professional musicians. And the microphone were placed uh, um, following a dodecahedral array, like in the, in the um, image. And finally, the convolution of anechoic recordings with the simulated uh, uh, breers uh, were done. So now I will play the two tracks. Uh, one, the first one, uh, um, corresponds to a listener sitting very close to the stage. And the second one uh, corresponds to a listener sitting uh, on the central box of the third gallery, the Royal Gallery. 
This is the first one. And the second one in the Royal Gallery. should have noticed that the first tract was uh, uh, a bit more reverberant than the second one uh, in the gallery. And in conclusion, um, we suggest a method to achieve uh, memorialization for an Italian opera house uh, by paying attention to uh, the measurement campaign of various theater configuration that allowed us to carry out an accurate computer model calibration and moreover, the model calibration paid particular attention to the input parameters uh, which were based uh, on the referred values. And um, following the recent literature as um, a guideline, uh, we extended the MIMO realization technique to an Italian opera house. We decided also to leave CAD models of the test theater and the simulated briefs uh, um, freely available in our website. And you can find the QR code. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So do you have a question or comment? Yes, please. Uh, do you mean the last uh, recorder on? Okay. At, uh, okay, thank you for the question. And at the end, uh, we put all the instruments together to simulate uh, all the orchestra. But we have a multi-track, for uh, one track for each instrument, and put all together after that. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The other question? <laughs> to take pictures. <laughs> Only take picture, okay. Uh, the other question, do you have? Okay, thank you again. Thank you for every presentator and uh, every commenter. Thank you again.